Hello, and welcome to Office Hours, the live version of the facility where I talk, oh, there's a preview, where I talk to you about a number of scientific topics throughout the week, and we will also take all of your nerdy comments and questions from the chat. Hello, I'm Professor Hill, and I have opened my doors after the lecture, and I'm still grading people's tests with red marker and being angry about it because I don't want to go home and have casserole again. So for the next hour or so, I'll be taking all of your reactions, comments, questions. If you want to join the facility and get this kind of treatment every single day, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill. And if you are in the chat right now asking me questions or using Super Chat, we'll try our best to get to all of them, to answer all of your nerdy questions in between all the topics. But my security team in the YouTube chat will be handling most of that. Please don't spam. Please don't say anything weird or else you'll just be banned because that's how I roll. Now, apparently, I have already shown you one of the topics that we're going to talk about today. It's whale shark spoiler alert. But today we are going to be talking about very good boys and how a new study basically redefines what a dog year actually is. It's not quite as simple as you thought. We'll also be talking about, okay, so my numbers are weird. We'll also be talking about masks because I feel like I have to, and because I get so much pushback, at least in America, we need to dive a little bit deeper into mask use, what it actually does, what it's actually for, and we have a new study that will help us do just that. We'll also be talking about whale sharks, as I said before, and we'll be taking one of your best comments from the previous episode on the facility, all about how COVID-19 is currently breaking our brains, and finally, We'll be talking a little bit again about COVID-19 and the recent protests. Now, I don't want to get political. I don't want to uh, push any agenda or anything like that. It's going to be purely a new study that has to speak to uh, that speaks to whether or not the recent protests actually increased or not COVID-19 transmission. I think this is something that we've all uh, had some thought about. I myself have had my own intuitions about what it did, but there's a new study actually looking into it. But before before we get in to it, we need to talk about our very first topic. Again, thank you for all the super chats so far. Let's get some good old doggos. Dog years. Man's and ladies and them's best friend, as they say. This is a golden retriever puppo. Arguably the best puppo. And so what I want to talk to talk about first, it's live is a redefining of dog ears. So if you're a dog owner or you love dogs or what have you, you've probably heard of the concept of dog years. Now, this is the idea that because, uh, because dogs don't live as long as humans, that you can track how old a dog basically is based on the length of a, uh, just length of a year. So if you track the lifespan of a dog, versus the lifespan of a human, you get an idea of how old a dog is relative to how old it actually is. So uh, the common idea is that one dog year, well, a year in a dog's life is equivalent to seven years in a human's life. So seven to one ratio. So if a dog is two years old, it's basically a teenager. And when it gets older and older, you know, when, it be, when it's 10 years old, that's a 70-year-old dog, like a 70-year-old person, very old getting up there in age. Now, we could have just taken this mm, knee-jerk style uh, linearization of a lifespan and just said, eh, it basically works, but scientists have actually now looked into it, and I always appreciate that kind of rigor. So, the study I'm talking about is a new study, and what they did is actually pose this question. This is what good scientific studies do. Well, we have this thing that we think is common sense or a good rule of thumb, Rule of thumb's a bad thing to say, actually, if you look into the... There's a good rule of me that says, uh, you know, tracking about seven years. Is it, is it actually seven times, you know, a one to seven ratio? And for this, they use Tom Hanks. I don't know why. I guess the authors really, write, really like Tom Hanks. So they're saying, is this really the case? Now, how you would go about actually determining what age the dog is, uh, aside from just chronologically, what these authors did for the study is look at the epigenetic changes in that puppo's genome. So 
they are looking at markers of aging itself. So instead of just saying, oh, one-year-old dog is like a seven-year-old person, they're looking into the DNA of the dog to see if it, uh, to see where it lines up with uh, the, the human signals of aging. So when they look into the DNA, at what age does it have similar deterioration, deterioration or damage to uh, human DNA at uh, a different age? So that way, they should be able to more accurately track because our metabolism and our DNA and you know, what proteins we're making, what mutations we're accumulating, that, depend, that determines how we age as we get older. If they can link those two things together, epigenetic changes, changes in the DNA based on the environment, then we get a better idea of how old a dog actually is biologically and metabolically speaking. So what did they find compared to Tom Hanks? Well, this study found this graph, again, compared to dog, to dog Hanks, <laughs> Tom Hanks. I can see him playing a dog. Anyway, so what our common sense notion of dog years is, is linear. That is to say, for one, for two dog years, it's 14 human years. And for, you know, four dog years, it's 28 human years. And this would be a linear graph with a slope of seven. But what the study actually found is more of an asymptotic. So it, it's, it, it's, a, it's exponentially increasing and then approaches some ultimate value near the top. What this means is that a dog or a puppo or a good boy how old are they actually in human years? Well, that depends on how old they are. Interesting, right? So when they are younger, their metabolic age increases more quickly than it does later in life. So when they're two years old, for example, they're not the equivalent of a 14-year-old person. They're the equivalent of maybe a 40 year old person. And this makes sense if you think about it evolutionarily for creatures that don't live that long. You know, 20 years is, you know, pushing the maximum for a dog. For creatures that don't live that long, it's advantageous to be very mature very quickly. That is to say, you know, a nine-month-year-old dog can start having uh, little doglets, little babies. And so that, that's evolutionarily advantageous because very early on in its life cycle, it can start having uh, kids and then those kids go on to propagate the genes of the parents and hopefully be uh, successful evolutionarily speaking. So this makes sense and it goes against our common sense uh, notion of how lifetimes progress. And that's because uh, we as humans have some of the longest lifespans that there are. And we think of ourselves linearly increasing instead of this kind of graph. When we're, you know, two years old, we're already very mature. That's what a dog is like. That's not like, that's not how humans are. So dog years now have to be redefined by a new complicated equation. This is not something you can just say. It's not uh, one, you know, uh, seven human years, one dog year. No, it depends. If you're talking about a very young dog, the equation you need to see, well, if it's one years old, it might be the equivalent of a 30 to one ratio. But around 10 years old, it looks around that seven to one ratio again. So you can see that there is a kernel of truth to the idea of the seven to one ratio, but it doesn't hold at all ages at all. So we now kind of have to re refine what a dog year means. How old is your dog, uh, humanly speaking? Well, that depends. Let's go to the chat. So we have a master of all, 1294, with the 20 who says, finally caught the live stream here. Keep up the good work and spreading the love of science. Hashtag simp for science. Here. That's what I like. That's what I like to see. Thank you so much for your support. It goes all back into the facility. Uh, change four with the 20 says, thanks for being you with a cute little emoji. Look, it's not that hard. By which I mean, I can only be me. But thank you for appreciating that. <laughs> Veildarg says, so if it's more of a logarithmic growth, which it is, good thing that you noticed that, can we call it dogarithmic? 
wait, 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 wait. Yes. That's great. <laughs> I am our... I am RRO com says being a dog owner for years. I did not need Tom Hanks to tell me this. We already know this Tom. Yeah, jeez. I don't know. I don't know why Tom Hanks is being so weird like that. Nathan Kelly with the five says Kyle. I'm trying to be better while discussing you, but failing badly. Hmm. What do you recommend when someone intentionally chooses to be ignorant? Well, ignore them. If someone's intentionally choosing to misunderstand something or misrepresent something then they're not encouraged they're not uh they're not willing to engage in an actual conversation and an actual conversation is the only way that we as humans can really progress forward in society so if they don't want to be a part of that leave them behind that's what i say eric chase with the 10 who says what's your take on using teleportation tech like in star trek i've always had the opinion that i wouldn't want to use one since i believe your original your original consciousness dies at the send node I agree. I also think that uh, if you have Star Trek style transporters are something that disassembles your body into its constituent particles, atoms, or even, uh, you know, subatomic, and then sends that information, that pattern, to a different node, and then reconstitutes you with available materials. It's not sending the material. So in all practical, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, you die in that instant. But because you are reconstituted in the exact same position, down to the quantum level it would have to be for the positions and velocities of every single particle in your body, which is an incomprehensible amount of information. Because you are disassembled, you die, but you're reassembled in the exact same portrait of your body, so theoretically, you would just continue on your consciousness from that point. So, would I use it? Uh... I mean, if there's if there's literally no difference and you can track the data that is your body that much, then there is no real difference. And so you could just continue on your life. But in, in terms of the practicality of something like this, the amount of information and the amount of precision that you would need to track the exact properties of every single particle in your body, I think is is theoretically or it's it's practically undoable. Mono G Mono GT Chan with the 10 says, Love the show. What if you used a modified particle accelerator to fire a one inch tungsten steel ball at 50% light speed? I know rail guns exist, but how, how fast could you get with a circular track? The problem is, is mass. So uh, you can get stuff going really, really fast, but when you get close to the speed of light, the amount of energy that you need to get something close to the speed of light because of how uh, physics gets weird, Relative, uh, relativistic effects, you need, you start to approach an infinite amount of energy needed to get something with mass up to the speed of light. That's why only photons can travel the speed of light. Now with our, with our particle accelerators, we can get things really close to the speed of light, like protons, but they have so little mass. We can actually get protons in our best particle accelerators, I believe, to uh, within three meters per second of the speed of light. Think about that. Out of 300,000 kilometers per second, you're missing just three meters per second. So we can get things going really, 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 really fast, but they have an infinitesimal amount of mass, like protons. To get a tungsten steel ball going that fast, it would obliterate itself way before it starts approaching light speed. Thank you for the 10, baby. Jason with the 15 says, first of all, love your content. That's called dead air. Anyway, this isn't related to what you were talking about, but would, but what would you see if a black hole was moving towards you at the speed of light? Well, I don't know, but because that's that would be hard for me to describe. But as a fun little tangent, the episode coming out this week on the facility uh, will be related to black holes, how they look, and how they look in different situations. So stay tuned. We'll be talking about that. Ooh, a promptly. Uh, VCDRNY with the 20 says, Thanks for what you do. I always have questions, but not today. Well, I appreciate you simping for science, man. Let's take one or two more before we get to our next topic. Uh, Devonta MC says, If you lose too much iron from your blood, would it change color? Uh, well, what's actually changing about your blood, uh, and, and the what, what changes the coloration of your blood isn't the iron content. It's the 
it's the uh, attachment of oxygen onto the hemoglobin protein, which that just happens to change the type of wavelength that comes off of that protein. So unlike what your uh, arms look like, this is, this is an illusion. Your arms look like your veins are kind of blue, but they're not. That's, that's, just, uh, that's just a change in the reflected light as uh, it goes through your skin or what it looks like under the skin. But your blood does change color. It's just never blue. It changed color from a light red to red, like it, it has a range of light red to deep red. And this depends on the uh, how much it is oxygenated. So if you lost iron from your blood, I don't know if that would necessarily be um, what changes the color. But if you lose oxygen from your blood, that definitely changes the color. One more from a recent, a recent member of the facility, Joshua, who says, Chauncey approves of your dog content. Chauncey, uh, Josh's dog, likes to watch the stream. Except he did say Border Collies are their best puppos. Eh. Also, did you know that dogs are about as emotionally complex as humans? By the way, season two of my D&D show. I know, Joshua! We'll talk about it. But that's what I love about dogs is that they, uh, they, they have a good emotional range to them. And you, they express that a lot of the times through their little dog eyebrows. And that, makes, that gives you a very good connection to them. And uh, that's... A, a good dog is priceless. But how old is it? That dependos. <sighs> I gotta keep doing this. You know why? Because I went to a different part of the country. I know I left the facility, but I went to a different part of the country this week. And in that part of the country, the United States, I was made fun of for wearing a mask. And this is why the United States has problems. So we're going to talk a little bit more about masks. And I know we've done this a number of times, but you never knew who's you never you never knew who's watching the stream. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about because there's a new study. So in this new study, they were looking at the effectiveness of cloth masks. Now, uh, if you post something on Twitter, for example, about masks, you will have a number of people coming at you saying, "Well, they don't work and the CDC changes their mind and this is oppression and fascism." Wrong. All of that's wrong. But let's use science to actually look into these questions. Like we saw with dogs, common sense notions of how things work or how things are aren't always correct. And that's why we need something objective, like science, to check ourselves before we metaphorically and possibly even physically wreck ourselves. So this new study was looking at masks, cloth masks specifically, and their uh, effectivity or efficaciousness, as a doctor would say. So what they did is a pretty simple setup where they have a dummy, not me, a dummy, <laughs> with a mask, smoke generator, and they pump it like this. <laughs> and they see the emission. So this emission would be mimicking how particles and gases are emitted from the face. And then, if you were to put different kinds of masks over this face, you would see different kinds of transmission or blockage or what have you. So if we dig into the study a little bit, the first thing that they did, which I found very interesting, was just emit gas uh, like a cough would. So they just stomped on this thing like, <clears throat> to see how far particles uh, and gases would actually travel. And what they found was this. Uh, as opposed to what the CDC says as guidelines to stay apart, not only does it travel six feet, it can travel up to 12 feet while staying rel relatively together as, as, a, as a bunch of air. So these coughs can travel unblocked by up to 12 feet. So the CDC recommendation is more for you should wear masks and socially distance, and then that makes sense. But you can see why masks are so important because these coughs can travel more than six feet. So if you don't have masks and you're not and you're standing close together, you see the problem because it's 12 feet and then everyone's going to be infected. You don't want that. So then they looked at a number of masks and how they affected this up to 12 foot transmission distance. And they looked into uncovered faces, bandanas, folded handkerchiefs, stitch masks. And this last one you can't see because I'm very good at uh, video production is a uh, off-the-shelf commercial mask like you could buy at CVS, I believe. And so different materials, you know, T-shirt, cotton, quilting cotton, and uh, I don't know, I'm a scientist. <laughs> and as you can see, 
like we are looking at in this first figure here, uncovered coughs eight feet. So more than the six feet, which is why it's important to distance and wear a mask at the same time, but eight feet. Now with a bandana, the bandana was found to be uh, the least effective. So it is still effective in that it cuts down the distance by more than half, down to three feet, seven inches. But bandanas are the worst masks you can wear to prevent uh, egress of gas from your face. So if you're wearing bandanas, instead, you might want to look into a folded handkerchief because that will cut that distance again by uh, two thirds down to just one foot or so away from your face. What's even better is a stitched mask like you may have seen me wearing at the facility or uh, on social media, and that cuts it down to just 2.5 inches. So from eight feet to 2.5 inches. Now you can see, now you can respond to those people on Twitter. What's the efficaciousness? Well, it keeps your potentially infected gross breath from going more than two and a half inches away from your face. And if you're combining that with social distancing, there starts to be a reduction in transmission. And what's even, uh, and what's interesting is that the off-the-shelf mask from something like a CVS was worse. So it looks like the stitch masks are pretty good with a high thread per inch count, of course. But moral of the story, bandana's bad, stitch masks or custom masks, pretty, pretty dang good. At the end of the day, though, all of these masks, even though there is some confusion on should I wear a mask, should I not wear a mask, yes, definitely wear a mask if you're going to wear a mask preferably something a little bit thicker, not a bandana, because they can reduce the transmission from something like eight feet, which is further than I am away from the facility's main camera right now, like further, down to just 2.5 inches and keep all your gross stank breath right by your gross stank face. Let's go back to the chat. <laughs> Imperial Fanatic says, would Darth Vader's mask work? I don't know how I what um I did a video on because science about this once. I don't think his mask is for filtration. What the canon explanation is is that his lungs got very damaged. Darth Vader's lungs got very damaged when he was breathing in the smoky air on Mustafar because he didn't have the high ground like an idiot. And because of that, he need he now needs a CPAP machine, which a lot of humans need when they are when their breathing is uh, inhibited or, or otherwise damaged. And what this does is create uh, the mask creates a pressurized environment such that it's easier to get air into and out of it. So uh, the reason why you breathe is because you increase the volume of your lungs. And when you do that, the pressure in your lungs drops below atmospheric pressure. Then the atmosphere, the world's atmosphere, wants to push its way into your mouth, if you want to think about it th that, that way. And so when there's lower pressure in your lungs, air comes in. And uh, when you squeeze your lung, it creates higher pressure forces it out. Now, what a Darth Vader mask or a CPAP machine, what it actually does is help that art, uh, give an artificial boost to those pressure differentials to help air in and out. So would Darth Vader's mask necessarily work? It depends what, what the distance is between the, the, the mesh on his face. Could be worse than a bandana. So I, I, I don't know. That's an open question. We should test it. Get George Lucas or whoever. Or whoever's screwing up Darth. Uh, <laughs> hey, Kevin, who's screwing, who's screwing up uh, Star Wars right now? No, no, no. Who's the person that made it so no one cared about the finale of the biggest movie series in, of all time? No, it wasn't the, no, it wasn't the Game of Thrones, guys. That's a good guess, though. I don't know. Get back to me. Taking shots. Guardian Angel 13 RN with the 20 says, Hey Kyle, thanks for everything you do. Love the topics today. Simple question. Someone wanted to look into an interesting study. What would you suggest? Hashtag Kyle for science. That's true. I am running for science this year. <laughs> um, that's super general. If you want to look at an interesting study, studies are everywhere. But uh, I'll give you a handy little tip. Uh, something that Google has is called Google Scholar. You just have to Google Google Scholar. And it's a... It's a um, it's a uh, specialty within Google. It's a specialty search engine that just searches scientific studies. So if you're interested in something, and we can do, um, we can do, oh, I guess I put a card in, in this, in this episode. Anyway, uh, if you want to, uh, we can do an episode on how to accurately read a scientific study. It's something I've been wanting to do at the facility for a while, but um, that would be a good place to start. Get a, get a broad 
sense of where the research is. Use Google Scholar and type in some good keywords. And they might be different than uh, the keywords you're expecting, so be vigilant about that. Um, because uh, scientific studies use a lot of jargon. The Reichenek, a recent and very active member of the facility, the Reichenek with 10 says, as you know, I'm a nurse. We are required to wear surgical masks. Any evidence on those contained in that study? Thank you, Simp for Science. Hashtag Simp for Science. Um, no, that was uh, in that study. They didn't have anything on the uh, efficaciousness of the uh, of, of uh, medical grade PPE. I, I think. Well, I don't know the specific data for that off the top of my head in terms of reduction of distance, um, because. This is a different regime. This study wasn't talking about this. This is just for egress. And this is where the confusion is. Why should people wear masks? It's to prevent your gross breath from going out into other people's gross faces. What medical grade PPE is, is doing is using a high thread count, uh, a very low porosity to prevent ingress, to prevent our medical staff uh, and, and nurses such as yourself from uh, inhaling particulate. So those are two different regimes and you'd have to look into a different study for that specifically. Master of all, 1294 with the five. I like to listen to your streams while working out. Speaking of, how's your bouldering going? My climbing gym opened back up and I'm very excited. Yes, I have been, uh, I have started climbing again. Uh, as some of you may know at the facility, I'm super, super into rock climbing. It's my other hobby other than Magic the Gathering and I'm really damn good at it. Uh, <laughs> only because I've been practicing for the last, I've, I've been climbing about twice a week every, every week for the last 13 years straight so uh and i used to teach at a gym teach classes i used to compete so um i wanted to get back into it my gyms have now opened up and they're doing it very well in that they're taking temperatures they're contract they're contact tracing in that they're logging you in and out there's only a set there's only you know a set number of people for a set amount of time there's social distancing lines everywhere anyway it's good to answer your question my bouldering's terrible right now so um, I'm part of a rarefied air of climbers who climb, uh, double digits, like V10 and harder. And, uh, when I've gotten on the wall, I've put on some poundage from, huh, from working out here, but also just being locked down. And so right now I feel really, really heavy and uncoordinated and, um, my forearm strength isn't there and neither is my skin. So right now I'm like struggling on V6, which makes me feel bad, relatively speaking. So it's, it's not going great. Thanks. Jesse Frederick Tench with the 10 who says, hey, oh, buy a treat for the, for the facility pets on me. Yeah, they're big pets. Do you have any thoughts on the future evolution of plant on the on our future evolution off planet or void ecology in general? So uh, kind of exobiology. I have no idea what I what I uh, what I would point towards. And let's stop the super chats for just a second as we can get to our next topic. But um, something that. I can't speculate off the top of my head, but something that I like that The Expanse does, the TV show The Expanse and the book series really well is it speculates that if humans were growing up under very reduced gravity in the um, asteroid belt, for example, they wouldn't have the same forces imposed upon their spines, for example, and they would grow to be much taller and much lankier. So I can see effects like that because we know our astronauts have to deal with a lot of stuff like bloating in the face because uh, fluids aren't flowing in the same way, elongations of the spine, changes in heart shape, so evolving in space over many, many generations, it would not happen quickly, but you could see some of these physiological changes, I believe. I, I don't think it would be anything crazy. I think it would start in the unseen, you know, changes in circulation and stuff like that. Uh, finally, Drew Bo Boning, Drew Boning with the 20 says, hey, Kyle, love the show. Been watching for years now. Ooh, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been dying to ask you this question. I don't know if you played the RTS Homeworld, but I was curious on your thoughts behind the hyperspace tech in it i have not played homeworld um hyperspace is the catch-all term you, you see it in in star trek and star wars and everywhere hyperspace is the catch-all term for traveling ftl or, or faster than light getting to some place faster than the speed of light would allow you and like we said just a few minutes ago the speed of light um is the is the speed limit in the universe because as you approach the speed of light it takes an infinite amount of energy to accelerate you to the speed of light and then past it. So nothing with mass can do that. And so uh, hyperspace tech is a sci-fi way of getting around that restriction. And there's no real science to it. There's, there's nothing that I know in physics that could really propel something like a spaceship or you FTL. 
why you see it so prevalent is because sci-fi authors are trying to reconcile the difference between having a cool story and the vastness of space. It's simply a fact that space is so large. Large-scale human civilizations in space probably won't happen in the way that they're depicted, at least in science fiction, and in economies especially, and, you know, relationships. Because it takes so long to get everywhere, even with really good engines, human stories and, and human lives would be radically different, and they couldn't operate in the same way. You know, if it took... Even if you're going half the speed of light, it would still take you eight years, or it would take you 16 years to get to the nearest star and back. And economies right now are not set up to have a 16 year delay, ne neither are human relationships. So hyperspace tech is not a real science-y concept. It's more of a good sci-fi workaround, a bending of physics as it were, to make sci-fi stories really compelling. And I've, I've spoken to the authors of The Expanse about this, you know, Especially for the TV show, Ty Frank says, you know, it wouldn't be very exciting to see someone traveling to a rock for two weeks. So hyperspace tech, less science, more story. Now let's get to our third topic. I love sharks. Sharks are maybe my favorite animal behind uh, the flamboyant cuddle cuttlefish. And uh, there are few sharks more impressive than the whale shark, the largest fish in the ocean, the largest bony fish in the ocean. And they are absolutely incredible and they're beautiful and they're not dangerous to humans or anything. They're not man eaters. All they do is they suck in a lot of fish with a giant gaping maws. So whale sharks are already awesome. But Kyle, you say, in this tone of voice, how could whale sharks get any more awesome? Glad you asked that, person who doesn't have an invisible mug. I'll tell you how. Eye teeth. <laughs> I'll tell you how. Whale sharks have teeth on their eyes. How metal is that? Don't worry, I'll show you. So whale sharks, in proportion to their body, have very tiny eyes. But those eyes have teeth on them. So uh, in a new paper, we're looking at a lot of new papers. In a new paper, uh, Sharks were look, uh, whale sharks were observed, and their eyes more specifically, and went, oh, jeez! You gotta warn me when you do that, Rodney. But when you look at a whale shark's eye, really up close, it's got a nice little pupe. And then you look more closely. So you see the shark's skin here, and what, and what shark's skin is famous for having uh, are denticles. So, you know, dent, you know, it, it implies teeth and bone. These are named after, you know, Teeth and bone words. <laughs> I'm a professor of English, as you know. Um, but it has denticles all across its skin. So uh, you may have heard that if you rub a shark one way, don't do this anyway. But if you were to touch a shark one way, it's smooth. But if you touch a shark another way, it's very rough and coarse and can cut you. That's because its skin is covered in denticles. And these denticles aren't really used offensively or anything like, like its teeth and its uh, jaws would be. But these denticles help uh, inhibit the growth of bacteria and uh, inhibit the attachment of parasites because on a rough, um, sharpie surface, technically, technical word, they have harder time getting purchased. And so now you see these denticles here. Look at the whale shark's eye. If you notice the same pattern here, these are denticles on the eyeball of the whale shark. Now, why would they have something like this? Take a second to think about that as we look more closely. So you have the whale shark's eye here. And you can see uh, an D in the figure, in the accompanying figure here. There, it does come out from the eye a little bit. And you have these little denticles, these little eyes, uh, these little teeth on whale shark eyes. Why would they have this? Well, like for the rest of their body, this would be to inhibit growth of bacteria and such, and especially parasites. Now, for a shark like uh, Mako shark, Mako sharks travel incredibly quickly. I think they're the quickest. Don't quote me on that. But Mako sharks are incredibly fast. And so when you're, in, when you're a very fast moving object in the water, it's harder for parasites, which are usually just floating in the water and then attached to stuff and then grow. When you're really fast, it's hard to attach onto you. But when you're really big, when you're really slow, when you're in fact the biggest bony fish in the ocean, 
parasites attach onto you, no problem. And you can see this in the Greenland shark, for example, an extremely slow moving shark that usually has parasites covering its eyes so much that it's blind. The whale shark's evolutionary adaptation to this is to put teeth on its dang eyes. How cool is that? So giant slow moving fish that would have a, a hard time clearing parasites off its own eyes. Solution, teeth eyes. And if you look more closely, we're not fooling around here. These denticles are sharp and they're like teeth and this is on its dang eyes. Even, uh, even closer, you can see that these have a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of scraping power, as it were, which makes it difficult for parasites to attach. Whale sharks have teeth eyes. Hey, not a lot of stuff gets cooler than that. Let's go back to the chat. Hayden Olar says, I couldn't imagine having something sharp sitting on my eye every day for my whole life. Well, I don't think they feel it, so to speak. It's just part of their, their skin. Susant says, I'm late. What's happening? I don't know. Just chilling. Not talking about teeth eyes. Bernard Sabinski says, evolution was drunk. See, I, there's, a, there's a lot of... Uh, pop culture cachet and saying like, wow, evolution is super, super weird. But remember that evolution only does what works. That is to say it, it, uh, it, it, uh, it works with random mutations that are thrown up into uh, a population and then natural selection, what is competitive, what is able to pass on its genes more often than its competitors, um, that is selected for because the genes in those uh, better performing organisms are passed on more frequently. And so with that, something can be weird or, hey, evolution, you're drunk, but it's there because it works and it has worked for millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. So it's weird, but if it ain't broke, don't change it, especially teeth eyes. We have Matt Creel, 95 with the 10, says, Hey, Kyle, love the show. Would it be possible to hollow out a mountain and build a city like Moria or Erebor from Lord of the Rings? Good question. Um, I think I, I, it would depend specifically on what you're trying to do because you want the structural integrity re to remain in the mountain, and I don't think you could completely hollow it out to the point where, you know, the layer of the mountain on the outside is very thin. But what you can do, and what we have done as humans, is dig out a, a you know a, a lot of mines through throughout it. And what you would focus on as some sort of dwarven engineer, you have to toss me, would be to carve out cavities inside of the mountain such that the structural integrity remains. And and I'm sure there's a lot of mass inside of a mountain that could be removed while maintaining enough integrity such that you could be uh, inside it without fear. I mean, we do the same kind, eh, it's not the same kind of thing, but we dig out mountains a lot and, and put nuclear waste in it. And we don't want that to go bad. Trust me. Gavin Elks with a five says, Hey Kyle, I was wondering what, who your favorite science communicators are, along with yourself, Brian Cox has me, hashtag sim for science. Who keep up the great work. I like Brian Cox because he talks about the universe. Kind of sounds like John Lennon on LSD. What if the universe was vast? And the end of the universe ended in a big crunch. <laughs> That's my Brian Cox impression. It's more of a John Lennon impression. My favorite science communicator right now, who I say very often in public, I'm not going to go with the tried and true answer of like a Carl Sagan or, or something like that. Because everyone likes Carl Sagan. If you have been sleeping on Alton Brown, you need to reconcile that. Because Alton Brown, I think, is the best living science communicator. Um, go on whatever streaming service it's on and watch Good Eats. And if you like food and you like science, you're going to love Alton Brown because he's a fantastic communicator because the skill of his communication is so good. And um, it's not that he's talking about the universe or he's doing crazy math or anything. It's more about his presentation 
where even on like the first episode of Good Eats, he's doing a, a he's delivering technical information while transitioning between multiple scenes with props and jokes and gags for like three minutes without cutting. And take it from me, at the facility, we do very few cuts, almost no jump cuts in the main shows. And take it from me, speaking like for a minute to three minutes without making a mistake while delivering accurate information that you can stand behind is extremely difficult. So uh, Alton Brown is kind of like my uh, science communication sensei right now. He's, uh, he's so, so good at what he does. And he's very compelling in the way that he speaks. And I think a lot of science communicators don't factor in the communication part of it, that the communication itself is important. And you need to be good at it or else no matter what you're saying, even if you're a Nobel Prize winner, no one's going to care. That's why you need to be lyrical and enchanting like Carl Sagan or very uh, arresting and uh, interesting like Neil deGrasse Tyson or uh, funny and quirky and rapid fire like Alton Brown or somewhere in between like me. I don't know how to describe myself. In fact, don't want to. A lot of people saying they also love Alton Brown. Of course. Basil says, is the speed of sound affected by gravity? Like if you shout down from a tower or up, will the speed differ? No. Uh, the speed of sound is not affected by gravity, but kind of, by which I mean that the density of air does affect the speed of sound. And the density of air is influenced by the gravitational pull of Earth. So our atmosphere is thicker at the bottom, more wispy at the top, you know, about uh, 62 miles up. That's when it gets so rarefied and so wispy that you can't tell the difference between the atmosphere and space. We call that the Kármán line. The more you know. But, uh, so the density of air, the, uh, think about how air travels, or, or how a pressure wave would travel in air, right? You have two molecules like this, don't get this. Two molecules like this, for information to be transferred, they would have to hit each other, right? Something would have to happen. Now, if air molecules are very far apart, this is more difficult because they have to travel for longer before they hit something. And if they're very close together, it's easy because they all hit each other and they're all very close together. So, if you have a pressure wave traveling through air, the denser that air is, closer to uh, sea level and below sea level, the faster speed of sound will be, and vice versa with up at the top. And uh, you can continue on this thought by saying, well, what if the atoms are even closer together? What if uh, it's water in a liquid where they're even closer together? Well, then the information can travel even faster. And in fact, the speed of sound in water is five times, it is five times what it is in air. Oh, let's go even further, Kyle. Yes, now you're thinking like a student. Now you're thinking like a critical thinker. Let's go even further. What about a solid where everything is the closest it can be together? Well, in fact, the speed of sound in something like steel is even faster. It's hundreds of times faster than it is in something like air. And now you're learning a little bit about the universe just by asking simple questions. I love that. And I love you. Not really. Just something you say. Let's go to the next topic. Okay, now what you can't see maybe you can, is I just spilled water all over myself, and that's what I get. And I'm tiny now. We're now, uh, we're now on to, it's live, we're now on to peer review, where I take, see, I spilled water all over myself. Now, where I take a good comment or a uh, response or something from a, the latest episode of the facility, and we honor it by going to peer review. This, uh, this comment comes from the most recent episode of the facility, more of a sit-down fireside chat with Kyle, where we're talking about COVID-19 and psychology. If you haven't watched that, please go watch it. But it's from Ad Astra Magdalene, who has something very poignant to say. So I had a point where, in the episode, I said, you know, there's a failure of memory here when people aren't taking COVID-19 and the pandemic seriously. It's been a long time at least in my generation, I've never experienced a pandemic. Not like this. But if you go back far enough, you, you will run into people who experience something like polio or uh, the measles. And those people remember how terrible it was. So right now, a lot of people of my generation or a little bit older don't have that cultural memory. And so they're not taking it seriously because they don't know how serious these things can be. But Ad Astra has something to say. They said, 
I was one of the first kids to get the oral polio vaccine. My mother stood in line with us for hours because she spent every spring worrying about the first mosquitoes appearing and spreading the illness as a vector. I had friends in wheelchairs from polio, and I don't think that's been a thing for 60 years. I'm not sure how you convince someone who's never seen people in the street every day on crutches and in wheelchairs. And this is no effing joke. No attempt to unseat some political leader. Diseases still exist, and they are happy mutating to avoid detection and treatment. And every person infected gives the virus access to new genes and new chances to get stronger. It's a very powerful comment. And I totally agree with Ad Astra here. If you don't remember and you don't have the memory of how terrible these diseases can be, if, you, if you're not psychologically affected by something like polio and you remember this, or you don't have a loved one who's currently gasping their last breaths in an ICU in Texas or Florida, it, it's, it's harder to wrap your mind around what's going on. But this is why we need to listen to each other and listen to the science and listen to the facts or else this is going to get away from us. And we can't let that happen. So for telling us this story at Astra, you are now an honorary member of the facility. That's amazing. That's just amazing. Kevin, do you, you have the plaque this time, right? What do you mean? What? How? In what sector? How did they get? Okay, just a second. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta take care of something real quick. Just a second. Oh! Oh, they're everywhere. Oh, why? Did... No. I, I don't know. Get one of the guns. Oh, my bones. Ah. Oh, I don't know. Aria, lock it down. Oh, Aria, lock it down. Five, six, and seven. That's right. Oh! Oh! Oh, they're everywhere! Help it! Help! Oh! Oh! Okay. Okay, that's a lot of... Okay, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. Oh, hey. Yeah, let's let's go back. Let's let's check out the chat. Oh, shit. It's fine. It's fine. Joseph Jonestar says, uh, the only thought experiment I've ever heard of was Rocco's Basilisk. All hail the almighty Basilisk, of course. Right your neck with the two said, did Kevin just die? Depends on what you mean by Kevin. Jay Jenks says, do you think engineering is closer to an art or a science? Um, I think, well, I think every profession has some degree of art in it, right? And so um, in engineering, uh, like I took, there are, of course, processes and, um, excuse me, and rules, there was something, Ugh. there's processes and rules of thumb that are more, you know, guesses. So in something, in a profession that's very practical, like uh, engineering, a lot of times you might eyeball something or go with a heuristic, you know, usually we do this, we don't have to do the whole math. So there's art involved in every science, I think. And that's just, uh, a lot of times that's just to save time or just be practical with something. Um, but in general, I would say that engineering is much more of a science than an art because you can't, there are rules, there are boundaries, you can't just do anything and expect it to work you you can't fly by the seat of your pants and say eh, you know what i think a bridge will work if i do it this way hey you can't exactly do that Jakob with the 10 says alton brown is amazing great choice i grew up on that show now for a question 
What would be the worst tasting planet in your opinion? Uh, Venus, because your it would your mouth would be obliterated. I think that since Venus's atmosphere and surface is effectively what hell would be, eating hell seems bad. And you can quote me on that. We have Axel Creed, frequent commenter and supporter with the five, who says, five dollar make you holler. Ugh, I'm not a clown. I don't perf I do not do tricks. Except sometimes I do that. Jonathan Melgard, Melgard with the 100, hashtag simp for science. Couldn't we use tech like Tesla valve or gun suppressors in our mass to slow down our breath? Huh. Well, the, the problem is with mass, it's not that you want to uh, stop. It's not that you want to stop the breath. It's that you want certain things in the breath not to get to you. And so, necessarily, if you have something a very fine filter, it's going to slow down the breath as much as it can and as much as it has to. So, it's not really a matter of slowing down the breath. It's more so getting the, the best filter, the best filtration that you can. In theory, you could have something that's incredibly effective at filtering something out. Maybe it's, it's not just pores, but it's also like, you know, ionization or something. So, in theory, you could have something that let your breath pass through as normal, but it was filtering out the, the pathogen and the particulate um, very effectively. And that would be a perfect mask, but we don't have those. We just have people complaining about masks, in my country at least. Aztec Dragon with a five who says, how things, how bad would you think, oh, how bad, it's life. How bad would things get if you cut down all of the tropical forests on earth? Well, the forests and the trees of the earth aren't the main oxygen producing places on earth. That's uh, all of the, uh, tiny little uh, tiny little microorganisms in the ocean and that's how oxygen started on earth with uh, cyanobacteria and stuff in the oceans producing oxygen as a waste product and basically a poison to everything else but trees aren't the main oxygen producer on earth but they they're one of the biggest and they are like the lungs of the planet and so if you were to uh, remove the lungs of the planet that sounds bad it would be like the planet had covid don't give the planet COVID. Save a tree. Bolwick, one of my professor emeritus's, one of the originals at the facility with the 20 says, fun fact about hollowed out cities, uh, Kinmen, the Taiwanese granite island off the coast of China, is a vast underground system with bases and hospitals. It's known for knives made from artillery shells fired during World War II. I'm going to have to check that out. Someone wants to put a link to that in the chat. That sounds awesome. Master of all, again, supporting Simping for Science. Hey Kyle, with the five, just want to let you know that you inspired me to go into a bachelor's of science in physics and mathematics. Keep up the spreading of science. That let's 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 end on that uh, before the next topic. Master of all, I'm so proud of you. If I mean, look look at how much I go through for you. This is not gonna heal properly, but I'm so honored to be a part of your learning journey, and I wish you all the best in your studies. And I will do my very best to continue to entertain and to interest you and everyone who watches anything that I do. You're going to do great. I can feel it. Because who has this much disposable income to me? It's got to be a nerd. And nerds do well in college. One of my recent facility members, whose name I, that I hate, called Poop Sled, with the 20, says, longtime fan, thanks for all you do. Sorry about my name. <laughs> See? It just, it just makes me think of, like, a crap toboggan, and I don't like thinking about that. Anyway, let's go on to our last topic. So, like I said, and this is an amazing photo, which is why I used it, but uh, like I said, I don't want to get political, but I think a lot of us had a general feeling that when all the protests for, uh, for everything that was going down, when all the protests were going on, that... It was unfortunate, not unfortunate they were happening, but unfortunate that they were happening during a pandemic because we had this feeling that if a lot of people were out, and this woman's not wearing a mask, but if a lot of people were out and about and crowding together, that this would cause spikes in COVID-19 cases. And when you go online, even today, I had some guy tweeting at me who said um, that uh, the spikes are because of the protests and therefore the protests were bad. You can see there's a fallacy here. Anyway, it's Twitter. But again, like we did with dog ears, is that true? Is our first reaction, is our, is our knee-jerk 
reaction to this relationship true? Well, we're looking at another study today that looked at just that. So what they did is they took uh, a lot of data and they uh, tried to correlate uh, the areas that had protests with people with uh, over a thousand people and a, a number of different protests, violent and unviolent, or peaceful, rather. <laughs> Don't want to do talking points there. But uh, peaceful, violent protests uh, with more than a thousand people across all the cities in the United States. They're just looking at the United States. And what they did was try to correlate those mass gatherings with spikes in those same areas of COVID-19 cases. And this would answer our question or not. This is our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is, and you state, hy hypothesis isn't just a question, if you don't know. Hypothesis is a statement that you're looking to, uh, to prove or falsify beyond statistical randomness. So it has to be beyond the null hypothesis, as they say. So our hypothesis is that uh, uh, mass protests in the United States increased the number of COVID-19 cases in those areas. So that's our hypothesis. Okay, well now, what does the data say in relation to that hypothesis? Well, these numbers are complicated, but let me just say that if it's above, if it's one or above, that means that cases are increasing. So as you can see, from actually, and all the days on all the areas they were looking at in the primary uh, counties that had these protests, from zero to two and all the way from 21 days plus, zero, 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 or negative. Now, when you look at all this data in aggregate, then, zero, 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 negative, what do we say about our hypothesis? Well, let's go to the authors. While it is possible, quoting them, while it is possible that the protest caused an increase in the spread of COVID-19 among those who attended the process, well, that's our hypothesis, we demonstrate that the process the protests had little effect on the spread of COVID-19 for the entire population of the counties with protests during the more than three weeks, three weeks, I can't read, three weeks following protest onset. Here's, here's, the, here's the big one. This is what I would bold in my report. In most cases, the estimated longer run effect post-21 days was negative, though not statistically distinguishable from zero. So that's the big point. The increase the possible increase in COVID-19 cases after protests was not distinguishable from zero. So our null hypothesis that we tried to overcome is that these two things are not related because our hypothesis said, well, they are. But what the data says is that there is no statistical difference between the number of cases naturally and what happened after the protests in the United States, which means despite even what uh, I thought and maybe many of you thought, there is no actual correlation, at least according to this one study, and one study is just one study. But according to this study, there is no correlation between the, the protests that happened and increase in COVID-19 cases in those areas. So if you see someone on social media or what have you using that argument in the face of this data, if they know about this data, that means they are trying very hard to make an argument against these protests and what they stand for for reasons that perhaps are not scientific. Let me put it that way. Let's go to the chat one more time. Music Central Piano, frequent donator with the 10, who says... Keep up the great work, Kyle. The scientific approach is the best approach, technically the best kind of approach. When we are incorrect, science lets us know with a tap on the shoulder or a pandemic. Let's not ignore it. Exactly. And as I've said a number of times on the show, we should we have gotten lucky because this is more like a test run. This, this is a, a dress rehearsal. This pandemic could have been much worse. There's nothing evolutionarily that prevents, that would prevent a virus from being much more deadly and much more transmission, transmissible. So what we need to do now is really identify what works, what doesn't, how we can cope with it, how our economies can cope with it, how we can cope with being at home and on lockdown. And we need to get these processes down, really down, so that when something really terrible does come along, we're not caught off guard. 
because that could absolutely happen. <laughs> As you can see, I mean, just today, the United States, the administration says they want to pull out of the World Health Organization for no reason. <sighs> Tony or Shadow with the $6 says, Hey Kyle, want to let you know a professor I do neutrino research with caught me watching your videos one day and loved your work, loved your hair too. <laughs> thank you. Tell your professor I say thank you. And if they're researching neutrinos, they're probably a lot smarter than me. So if they're watching my videos and I did a good job, according to them, best praise I can get. Aside from kids liking my work. But tell your professor I said hello from me personally. And that, thank you. I'm really good interacting with people face-to-face. -face. We have a 10 from Anton Marchenko, who says, What do you think about evidence that magnetic field actually helps evaporate our atmosphere quicker than it would without it? Do you think we'd ever be able to terraform Mars without the magnetic field? Uh, I've actually never heard... I haven't heard of that line of reasoning that our magnetic field helps evaporate our atmosphere. Um, in fact, I, th I think it's the opposite in that our magnetosphere the uh, sphere of magnetic fields around the planet Earth prevents radiation like uh, that from the solar wind, which comes screaming in from the sun at a million miles per hour. It prevents our atmosphere from being effectively blown away. And so it would be very hard to terraform Mars without something like a magnetic field or without going underground or what have you because we know this. Um, we know that the atmosphere of Mars after the magnetosphere died down was blown away by the solar wind and is very wispy and does not have enough gas to sustain life as we know it. Just one more or two more questions before we wrap up here. Yeah. Java Monk, Java Monk says, been a huge fan of you for a long time. What kind of stuff can you do with a hill engine? Can you dig out an underground lair for maybe super villain in denial like me? No, I'm not. Well, the Hill engine is an engine that I propose, very scientific engine, where you would replicate the thrust of a Saturn V rocket by throwing blue whales out the back of it at the speed of sound, like every second or so. Yes, I know this would rapidly depopulate the planet of killer uh, of blue whales. I know that, but the engine would be think of it, just think of it running. What could you do? Well, I mean, with the effective thrust of a Saturn V engine, you could do pretty much anything that you wanted. Hill engines. Throw whales. Get your way. TM. Uh, Hemso says, is the zombie infection in The Last of Us actually possible? I think it is very plausible. And if you want to see why, you can watch a recent episode on the facility called The Last of Us Science, Everything You Need to Know. Uh, Jabo Funtime says, uh, one of my security teams says, Hey boss, there's uh, some more of those things outside the core. Maybe we should wrap. You know what? That's a, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I, I don't, I gotta. Okay, so what do we do today on Office Hours? Well, I hope you learned a lot from my nerdy analysis of this week in modern hellscape. But we talked about, first, we talked about very good boys and puppos and girls. <laughs> As to, uh, we, we talked about how dog ears, our conception of dog ears, doesn't really track with the genetic reality of how a dog ages. In fact, it's not linear. It's not seven to one. It depends on how old the dog is at every point. It's logarithmic, or as one commenter pointed out, dogarithmic, which is what I'm going to say from now on. If a dog is very young, it matures much more quickly than seven to one. And when it gets older, that's when it starts getting closer to that seven to one age. We also talked about mass and why you should be wearing one, of course, because it reduces the distance that your gross breath travels. But specifically, those bandanas that the CDC said, you know, you should even wear a bandana. It does matter what kind of cloth that you're wearing. Stitch masks seem to work best. We also talked about whale sharks, how cool sharks are. Not only do they have teeth on their skin, they have teeth on their eyeballs. How cool is that? We talked about something in peer review, how our very short memory as a species kind of makes it harder to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we talked about how there is actually no link, at least according to one recent study, between recent protests and spikes in COVID-19 cases. If anything, the spikes that you're seeing now are coming from people being dumb on the 4th of July. 
well, we're not seeing those cases yet, but we will see those. It's from lockdowns reversing too quickly. Thank you so much for joining me in this episode of Office Hours. If you want to keep the conversation going, if you want to talk with me basically 24-7, if you want to join the 1,200 nerds on Patreon and on Discord who are chatting with each other, helping me come up with uh, facility canon, talking about the episodes, giving me feedback. Have We have our own game nights, our own Magic the Gathering League, uh, uh, movie nights, we have our own uh, radio station, all this stuff. You can join us at patreon.com slash Kyle Hill, my security team, and Jabo will put it in the chat if you want to join. It's pretty fun, pretty active on there, and I love the little community that we're building. Also, the facility has new merch. If you want to get some of that merch, you can go to, uh, you can search for SciFile on Redbubble, and then you can buy some facility merch. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Um, please stay safe. Stay healthy, stay uh, stay cognizant of what we're dealing with here. And if someone isn't wearing a mask, yell at them and say, hey, where's your mask? And then quickly pivot and say, hey, did you know that whale sharks have teeth on their eyes? To hopefully chop off any negative reaction. Have a wonderful rest of your week. If I don't talk to you until then, be nice to each other. Because, I mean, when you're not, you, because this is all we got.